<laughs> oh, and I'm live. Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to tonight's virtual event. My name is Sam. I'm the events coordinator at A Room of One Zone, uh, and it is my pleasure to welcome uh, four authors. We are celebrating, of course, the release of Stephen Salvatore's And They Lived uh, just now recently, and joining Stephen uh, to welcome this book to the world, three other YA authors. Uh, they include Becky Albertalli, author of many, many books, most recently Kate in Waiting and Here's to Us, which was co-written with Adam Silvera, uh, Jason June, author of most recently Jay's Gay Agenda, and Julian Winters, author most recently of the forthcoming novel, Right Where I Left You, out next Tuesday. Uh, all of these books and everything else these authors have written is available for purchase on the Room of One Zone's website. Uh, please stop by and visit. Um, you can deposit questions in the chat uh, for the authors as you think of them, and then I can feed them up on screen to them to answer. Um, so once again, thank you all on behalf of Room of One Zone. Uh, it's great to see you all here. I'm going to pass it over to our authors and uh, have fun, everybody. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hi. <laughs> ah, okay, so first of all, I just have to say thank you, Becky, JJ, Julian, for being here and just supporting me in this book i am so honored to just be in your presence like mentioned in the same breath in the same universe in the same <laughs> galaxy as all three of you um truly truly uh thank you so much um i just love you all so much thank you for having us yes. i'm so excited to celebrate you Yo. So great to finally talk about the book my goodness <laughs> I feel okay. I, I I just want to like scream about this book like every day, all day long for the rest of my life. Um, if I never write anything again, I I think I will. I'll be happy. Um, <laughs> but oh, I I do want to say to everybody who is listening, who's tuning in. Um, I am going to be doing a giveaway of the books that are here uh well okay so and they lit okay i don't know where i'm pointing and they lived <laughs> jay's gay agenda here's to us and not the summer of everything but julian winter's new book that comes out literally in six days i don't know math but whatever know. next tuesday is i believe it's six days, <laughs> uh, right where i left you um so i am gonna i'm gonna hold that over all of y'all's heads out there who are listening <laughs> Um, and watching along. And um, if you ask questions and comment along, um, A Room of One's Own will pick a winner from the people who, you know, join in. So I suggest you participate. That's the teacher in me, like, <laughs> people to participate, like bribing with like Kit Kats, um, except I do not have a Kit Kat. I have uh, four books that are great. So highly recommend you participate and then read all of them. Um, so hi everyone. How's everyone's week going? <laughs> I don't know, I'm making small talk now. <laughs> and I've been so excited for this. I just, um, I'm so happy for you. I'm so happy for, you know, just everybody who is gonna get to fall in love with this book. Um, and I'm so happy to be celebrating this um, with the dream team here. <clears throat> Mm, thank you. Thank you. And total ditto. Yeah. All Star Squad. I mean, seriously. <laughs> seriously. Okay, I want to. Okay, I'm going to take the spotlight off of me for a second. Julian, how are you doing six days out from right now? Uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> we're going to just divert attention completely. Um, I am. Let's just say I have been consuming quite a few like Reese's peanut butter cups to kind of like. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it's really, really weird um, to, because I didn't have a solo book come out last year. Like I only had anthologies. So now to have a book come out again, um, I'm like, oh, is this what it's like? Why do I sign up for these things? I don't know. So, um, I guess I'm all right, but back to everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I was like, I'm gonna throw you a curveball and ask you about you. I'm so excited for it, Julian. You know, I love everything that you write, and it's just, it's just gonna be a really amazing treat for us. Oh, I know. I haven't, I haven't read it yet, and I'm like, 
bursting at the seams to get my copy. Um, I, I just love everything that you write. Thank you. Um, so I am just so, so excited about it. I, I honestly appreciate that. Um, I do. Let's talk about Jason's new book. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, by the way, is freaking brilliant. Oh, oh you God. read it? Yeah, I read it last year. Jason, um, I unsubscribe. I utterly, <laughs> utterly obsessed with Out of the Blue. When I tell you uh, that this book moved me in a way that I have not been moved by a book in a really long time, um, in, in ways that I like truly was not expecting, um, I, it's just like it deserves absolutely everything in the universe. Um, so I am just beyond excited. Thank you so much. I can't wait for it to be here. The best part is Ricardo Bass's cover. I can't get over that. I love with it. So the uh, the I'm cover so is obsessed with it. And this is actually going to be the print of the cover is going to be part of the pre-order goodies for people who love it. I just love that we have Crest Finn out and proud. I love that we have a fat love interest just ready to swim on the cover and just we get all this great body positivity. It really means so much to me that this cover came out how it did. Yes, yes, we need more. We need more uh, body positivity and yeah, thicker characters for the win. And thick <laughs> love interests. Yes, yes. That was something that I really wanted to to explore with And They Lived was, you know, having, having a thicker love, or, or not a love interest, but main character. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that he's just not quite there with accepting his body yet until somebody else finds him beautiful and worthy, which is, I don't know, kind of a, an interesting concept and one that I was kind of, uh, I don't know, was a little bit nervous to write. And, um, Cause like, I know like as Problematic fave RuPaul always says, if you can't love yourself, how are you going to love somebody else? But like sometimes, sometimes other people's love can help you love yourself. I don't know. Um, at least that was a lot of my experience in trying to like find myself and, you know, love myself and who I am. And, and I'm still not there fully. Um, did I just bring down the vibe? I think I did. Oh, not at no, all. I, I mean, I've been, I've been really excited to talk about this um, with this book because I do think, um, you know, like, I mean, can I can I say, like, body dysmorphia? I, I don't, that's not a spoiler. That's. No, no. Okay, I've, yeah. been, I've been, yeah. I've been saying that because I think that's a, I think that's an right. important talking point, I think. Yeah. I, you know, it's just, I think. Um, and I've, I've talked to other authors too about this, like, that's, um, a really hard topic to, um, you know, to weave into a book in a way that, um, I don't know, I guess there's certain expectations, I think, um, for that representation. Um, and I complete, I'm, that I, I understand exactly where that comes from. Um, but sometimes I think, you know, we end up um, kind of excluding um, some narratives that are going to make a lot of people feel seen because they're not necessarily like the neat and um, tidy narrative that, um, you know, that another group of readers may be looking for. Um, which is, you know, it's it's a tricky thing, um, kind of navigating the fact that the book that some readers need is going to be a book um, that just is, you know, whether it's triggering or something or whether kind of some readers may have to avoid it. Um, how does it feel to be like you know, putting such a, just a deeply felt exploration of um, body dysmorphia and some of this uh, body image stuff in a way we don't usually see it. 
Well, so uh, before before we hopped on this live broadcast, uh, Becky and I were sort of chatting about this idea of like what it's like to like write for yourself and like, mm -hmm. you know, channeling everything into your stories, because like, you know, I, I think there's for a while and, and I think this sort of prevails is that like there is this idea that like writers must write for a very specific audience and it's not the writer you know him or her or them or themselves right like it, it has to be like a very specific like focused group um and especially when you're writing for teens right like you have to keep a teen audience in mind and obviously like as you know writers who write for young adult audiences the all four of us like we we do have to keep our teen audiences in, in mind but i really do write for myself to process the things that I've been through and my feelings about, you know, certain events. And it's, I really wanted to be as raw and, and real and upfront about how I felt about my body growing up. And, um, you know, because I suffer, I, this is in the author's note at the end, like I suffered from disordered eating, ever since I was a kid, basically, when, you know, I was, I went from, you know, a normal sized child to a not normal sized child, right? And to someone who like, was the subject of a lot of microaggressions from a lot of family members about my weight. Um, and so it was like, I went from, I was like doing, um, what was it? Slim fast shakes before I even hit puberty, like just downing those as like meal supplements and then Weight Watchers before I even hit high school and, you know, Atkins, don't even get me started on Atkins diet um, back then, which is like you could eat a, like a whole slab of bacon, but not an apple yeah. um, because God forbid you have an apple. Uh, mm -hmm. It was just like doing horrible things to my body because I was told that I wasn't beautiful or I wasn't like the typical standard normal weight for a child my age. Um, and then that lent itself to abusing laxatives and, you know, doing even, I, I was doing um, a, there's this seven day um, medical diet specifically for people who are undergoing heart surgery um, that you like, you do this very special diet for seven days leading up to the surgery in order to drop weight really quick. Um, and I was doing that for like months straight every day in order to drop weight, which is so unhealthy because it was like consuming hardly any calories. Um, and then like you would build up to like a freaking potato or something. Um, and it was like, Ooh, I get to have a potato. What a great little thrill of my life. Um, and um, it, it, it was just this constant cycle. And, you know, I said, I said this the other night, um, at my in-person launch, like I, when I look in the mirror, I don't see what other people see. I look in the mirror still to this day and I see like a horrible, like demonic monster, like of, of a person, um, and like my, the, what I see never really fit. Um, and so I just, I wanted to just be a little bit intentionally messy with it because I think that's just how people experience that. And, you know, you sort of have to sort through your feelings and process everything. And that can be really hard for someone who's a freshman in college, um, trying to navigate like all of these other things, like first love and having sex for the first time and all of these um, you know, these milestones. Um, and so I don't know, to get back to your question, Becky, or part of it, I think, um, it was really, it was scary. It was scary to write all of this down. Um, especially because like, you know, I know they say don't read the comments, but you know, sometimes I can't help going to the, 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 uh, the website that, um, I shall not mention by name. Um, <laughs> But, you know, there, there's there's like people saying like this is fat phobic and I'm like, I'm not this is not fat phobic like this is somebody who experiences body dysmorphia and hates their body and 
is putting themselves through hell. And it, he, Chase needs to get to a place where he can accept who he is and love himself. Because it's not just about accepting his body, but loving his body. Um, and he does get there. Readers just have to give him a little bit of grace and a little bit of time. Um, and I think that that's a very real experience. Like, I don't think it's a normal thing to expect people to be comfortable with themselves all the time, especially at a young age. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. How do y'all, the rest of y'all feel about what I just said? I don't even, I, I rambled. I think you, Chase's journey was portrayed so well, especially I think in the queer community for male bodied people, this sort of pressure on how your body needs to look is so prevalent. And I just super related to Chase's journey in that as a gender queer person, college was when these kind of issues really struck home for me that I didn't feel like I was presenting myself as other gay guys thought I should look. And there was so much stress and disordered eating because of that. And I think this is a really common experience in the queer community. And you portrayed it so well, Stephen. And it's just like, this is, it really strikes in college for a lot of people or like just post high school when you're finally an adult that gets to make your own decisions and you finally get to shape who's around you. And you finally get to come into your own as a sexual being. And you realize the images that other people are sexually attracted to and can just really get into your head when you feel like you don't fit that image. And I related to Chase so hard. I think you wrote it so beautifully. And just like you're saying, there's ups and downs to it. It's not that you're writing a fat phobic character. You're writing a character who is worried about how the world perceives himself and is grappling with that. And it's not always pretty and it's not just a nice, straight, easy journey. And I loved how you wrote it. It can be really difficult sometimes to write something, to write something that is on, on the difficult side because you have those voices in your head going, how are readers going to perceive this? Um, and are, you know, is, is, can the worst happen? And of course the worst can always happen. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know, I feel like we shouldn't shy away from writing about real important things that matter to not just teens, but to anybody who's reading who has sort of needed our stories. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that so much, um, everything y'all are saying. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's really um, important to keep in mind just as readers, because all of us are readers, um, is that, first of all, every single one of us um, has the right and we and we should, you know, curate our own reading. If you are not in a place where you can... Um, you know, take that in right now, that's totally fine. Like mm -hmm. that's so valid. Um, but um, yeah, I think there's so much to be gained from, you know, just um, letting yourself jump into a book uh, about an experience like this that you maybe can relate to, maybe not. Um, you know, I could, I could certainly relate to a lot of it, um, you know, and um you know, understand um, kind of, you know, by um, walking uh, next to Chase through that emotional journey, um, you know, you are getting to like, you know, experience what that is like in Chase's head, what um, those microaggressions look like and how they play out and how they affect you. Um, and how they linger. And I think um, there's so much value in that. Um, I, you know, and that's not even getting into the, um, oh my God, I, like, I'm, I'm just, I'm imagining you're going to get so many messages. They're just like, I, like, I feel like you wrote about me. I feel so seen. I needed this. I felt alone with this. I thought I was the only one who felt this way, or it wasn't okay to feel like this. You know, it's funny because I've gotten I've gotten a couple of those already. And I'm like, this is so weird, but I'm so happy because 
I never really saw myself or that part of myself in anything um, that I read or, or watched on TV or watched in movies. Um, and I think, you know, like you were saying, JJ, like it's very, um, it's very prevalent in, in, in the gay community and the queer community, you know, of the, I think we're just so inundated with these ideas of like what we should do, what we should look like, what mm -hmm. we have to be. Um, and that it's, it's, it's like these series of like, you know, flashy, glittery, photoshoppy uh, Instagram posts of like, this is what like the acceptable queer person looks like. And it's like rippling abs everywhere. And like, okay, well, I'll never have those unless I have like some sort of like cosmetic surgery to like give myself abs, which I don't, is that even a thing? Because maybe I should look into that. I don't know. I can ask my plastic surgeon because I have one now. <laughs> I, you know, I'm and now I'm curious. So I would, uh, you can text me about that later because I want the answer. <laughs> uh, but I'm happy. I'm happy that like y'all were able to um, to sort of see what I was trying to do there. Yeah. So that means a lot. Definitely. Thank so, um, while we're on this subject, we have to go like back a bit though, because I am such a behind the scenes person. Like I Wikipedia everything and i have to know like start to finish of movies and tv shows and everything so i need to know and the audience needs to know too what is the origin story behind you writing this book like what where did the idea spark from what really like just really got this role especially with it being book two which everyone knows is the most dreaded of them all oh yeah <laughs> okay so so the book two thing I think is a really interesting thing because so I've heard, I've heard so many horror stories of like people struggling to write book two and like get that right. And <laughs> I, for me, like, <laughs> okay, I guess I'm the outlier here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but for, for me, like being able to sell can take that away was like such an immense like weight lifted off of my shoulder. Cause I was like, Oh, I, I got through the door. Like I can do this. Like, cool. I, I did the hard part. And, and, and then the pandemic hit. Um, and it, it was just like, well, what the hell else am I going to do? I might as I, I can't go outside this <laughs> March of 2020. There's no toilet paper in the stores. <laughs> I really can't go anywhere. What am like? What am I gonna do? But like sit and and just write. And so, um, to sort of backtrack a little bit with this book, I came up with this idea um, because Chase was a, a character that I, I invented um, in my head when I was like 15 years old as a way to like shield myself from like my life. Um, and like how much I hated myself and I, I hated, I hated my body. I hated my everything. And so I sort of created Chase as like this alter ego superhero character of like, you know, he loves himself and he knows who he is and he's an artist. And cause I wanted to be an artist and that was my goal was to, you know, go and, and, uh, I wanted to go to Cal arts and work for, you know, Walt Disney animation. And that was always my dream. Um, and so Chase was a way for me to sort of live that, even though um, I felt like I wasn't talented enough or wasn't good enough and I couldn't, you know, pursue any of that. Um, and so when I was, I think I was 19 when I was a sophomore in college and I had taken a bunch of creative writing classes. I was a writing major. Um, and so I thought like, I think I'm gonna write this person's story. Um, and so that was the first book that I ever wrote when I was 19 was about Chase. Um, but he was super duper straight. Um, but not really, um, because like he was in love with his best friend, um, who was a girl. Um, but like he would spend all day on campus, like staring at shirtless men. So like, he wasn't really straight, but like he was straight on the, on the surface. Um, <laughs> And it was like, it was one of those moments where like, this isn't working because I'm not telling the truth. 
Um, and I, I recognized the, the fact that it wasn't working, not why it wasn't working. Cause I was still deeply in the closet. Um, and so I put that, away for a couple of years. And when I started um, grad school in 2009, um, I was like, you know what, I think I'm going to unearth Chase because he's calling out to me and I really want to try to get his story right. Um, so it became the, the second version of his story was um, he was deeply in the closet and slowly coming out of it where it was like an act three kind of coming out. Um, mm -hmm. and his mom like freaked out and kicked him out of the house. Um, and then in the third version of the book where I like scrapped it and rewrote it again, um, it was like a first act coming out and his mom kicked him out of the house. There was a lot of very, there was a lot of versions of this book where Chase's mom threw him out of the house for being gay. Um, and then it evolved into like a road trip story. Um, that took on a couple of different versions and drafts. Um, and so basically all of this is to say, like, I am the definition of beating a dead horse. Um, I, I could not let this character go. I, I, it's like, you're always told like when something is not working, like honey, move on. Um, but like, I, I couldn't, I couldn't put him down. Um, and then the, the second to last version of his story was so awful um, cause I was like, I'm really going to try to make like one of these awful drafts work. And it just, it, it derailed so spectacularly, um, that I thought I would never get an agent, but I actually ended up getting an agent with that version. And then that went to crap. Um, and so then I, I wrote and sold, can't take that away, um, with my, my now agent. Um, and when the pandemic hit, I was like, I need to have some backups for my two book deal, the second book and my two book deal. What am I going to do? I think it's time for me to like unearth chase again. He's speaking to me. <laughs> and so I just like sat down and in like 44 days, I wrote this draft pretty much as it is. Um, and it very, very little, um, edits went into this book. There were a couple of little tweaks here and there. Um, I think the majority of the tweaks uh, came from my editor who was like, maybe let's um, dial down the sex just just a smidge, <laughs> just a hit. We love it. <laughs> sex is great. It's good. Like I, I am a big fan of it. However, maybe it doesn't need to be as graphic as it is. Um, so... Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I think it was like pandemic and like Chase finally being ready to come out and like have his story shine um, that I didn't really feel that like second book sort of blues. I think it was more like I need to have a second book and this is calling out to me thing. Um, yeah. That is so amazing that you didn't have many edits with this because it's like it's so good. It is so good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's surprising because I will tell you my third book that's coming out next summer almost killed me to write, to, to edit. I, I will say, because I just, I just sent those in like a week ago um, or a week and a half ago. And let me say I, that was a struggle. I was struggling. It was like such a massive overhaul like deleting massive chunks rewriting organizing reshuffling around um so that was the heaviest lift i've ever done um so i guess it's fitting that i didn't <laughs> i had to like pay my dues somehow somewhere so <laughs> <laughs> you were just letting the book two blues ferment <laughs> there's a little fermentation going yeah on. <laughs> Yeah, that's an amazing origin story. And also, too, I, like, you know, I think that 100% counts as putting the work in because, you know, through all these different versions of Chase, you're getting to know him. And that's, you know, like, the, I think that is part of what makes these characters feel so, like, lived in, you know, like these relationships. Mm -hmm. Um in that kind of effortless way that I think we 
the readers are picking up on. So thank you. I appreciate that. It's it's funny because I thought um almost every version of Chase's story was a coming out story. Um and I was like, no, I don't want a coming out story. Um I I I I did that so I wrote it so many times that by the time I was at this version, I was like Girl, this he already is out. I like he, <laughs> he's out in so many different drafts. Like I need, I need to let this poor kid breathe a little bit. Uh, <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> so I, like, I can't, I can't keep putting. And it was like I can't keep putting this emotional torture on myself. Like I feel like I'm coming out every time I was writing this story, mm -hmm. um, and it was it just it got to the point where it's like I'm exhausted. Um, I don't want to, I, I feel like, uh, you know, in different ways, it's like, we have to come out all the time in real life. Uh, it, it's, I, I was like, I can't, I, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> I also really love in this whole like years long process of, you knowing Chase, Chase started as this straight guy and then ends up being gay and then is exploring his gender. And I love that layer of it. I love uh, the moment where Chase is sort of like saying to himself, like, can't I be non-binary or genderqueer and also use he, him pronouns and mm -hmm. asks his professor per for permission to use he, him pronouns. Like, this is okay, right? That I can still like not identify as cis, but want to say, want I still am okay with going by he, him, maybe they, them. I'm still figuring that out. I love that whole journey. And I kind of want to go through your thought process of including that bit in Chase's discovery uh track <laughs> yeah <clears throat> well it's sort of it, it comes again from that thing from that place of like i'm i'm writing my books for me i'm writing to process my own stuff um so it was this thing of what am i going through right now and it was coming off of can't take that away where i threw and poured like all of my thoughts and all of my anxieties and like everything into poor little Carrie and poor little Ca I mean, they went through it and, and you know, I, I, we, we love them and they are, you know, such a, a sweet little like marshmallow puff of a, of a kid. Um, but I, I, I wanted this to be sort of like where I'm at right now, which is like, you know, maybe they, them, maybe he, him, maybe I like he, him better. And maybe it's like, maybe it's more of a comfort thing of like, this is, I was always he, him for the majority of my life. And so it doesn't necessarily not fit me. Um, and so it was like, it was that part of like, I'm, I, let me like process all like now that I, now that I got Carrie on the page and I got Carrie out of my head and like everything that I was experiencing was filtered into Carrie. It's like, now I, I want to continue that thought process with Chase. Um, and because Chase is, he's struggling with like trying to figure out like, no, I like, I am non-binary or maybe gender queer. I don't really know what term fits me yet. Mm -hmm. And, I, I'm, I'm somewhere. I'm like, I'm fluctuating. I'm, I'm like, I, I don't really know if any of these terms really fit me. Um, but I, I'm not really struggling with that fact. It's more of like the labeling of it. And, um, because like, I remember like when I was processing all of my feelings and thoughts about like gender stuff, it was always like, no, if, if you're non-binary, you have to go by they, them pronouns. Like that's it that's you that's that's the only choice um and that felt a little restrictive for me personally um and so like when i started seeing other people go by they them and he him or they them and she her or they them she her he him it's like oh there's like there's more possibilities and i don't know which combo platter fits me um <laughs> So it's, and it's funny. It's like, I, I like, like JJ, like when, you know, I, I, I've noticed like your spiel, like in interviews, you're like, what, whatever energy you feel best. And so yeah. like, I've adopted, I've adopted that 
because it, it, it works. It really does. It's like, what, what energy are you feeling for me? Are you feeling they, them? Are you feeling he, him? Like yeah. go with, go with whatever, like aura I'm giving off. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of, that was my, that was my thought process there. Um, and then I really liked having um, Chase, Chase's mentor, um, Professor McPherson in the book, who um, is also non-binary and uses she, her. And, you know, she's like, listen, honey, like you can define this however you want. Like you are, you are you. It doesn't matter what you, <laughs> what you go by. It, it doesn't. Um, as long as you feel comfortable. Um, and so it's like, yeah, we're landing on comfort. I like comfort. I love that. That was the best when she was like, there are no rules. You can decide what it is. <laughs> and I think what's really great about Chase, like getting to be in his head during all of this, especially for cis people or straight people that don't have a lot of exposure to the queer community. I think a lot of times those people can think like, that can get defensive because they don't know all the answers and when it's not a part of their life, but seeing somebody like Chase that also doesn't have all the answers where it's like, it's not about you being right or wrong. It's just about going on this journey together and giving each other grace as, as I'm figuring myself out, as I'm giving you space to, to be a part of this journey while I'm figuring myself out. And I just really love that where, where it's a, just a moment of humanity where it's like, we're all trying to figure it out. And it's just coming at it from love and acceptance is the way to go about it. I think it's, it's so funny because I think the beauty about being queer is that like, we get to forge our own paths and, and we're constantly evolving and things are constantly changing and nothing is ever really stagnant. Um, and I think that, I think the biggest like um, secret maybe or the thing that like, like other like cis het people like don't really want to recognize is that maybe they're also constantly changing and evolving, and that's really a scary thing. Um, and maybe as queer people, we're more like willing to be like, "Hey, yeah, uh huh, I am constantly changing and evolving, and like this is the thing." And and that can be scary for a lot of people. Is like, oh, maybe things aren't always so concrete. Um, I don't know. I don't know how y'all feel. How do y'all feel about that? Um, I mean, I have like, I don't know. I, I think I have complicated feelings about it because I, I mean, in my experience, it, you know, the, I haven't always found queer people to automatically um, be able to, and willing to recognize kind mm. of that fluidity mm -hmm. sometimes um, because I think, you know, and I, I mean, I think all the time about where that comes from. And I think like there is a, um, an element of kind of feeling like um, you have to defend your identity, um, which kind of, you know, puts a um, firmer like wall around it, I think, yeah. and makes, uh, can make labels a little bit more rigid sometimes. Um, obviously mm -hmm. this is not universal. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's um, like, it can be really unsettling to see somebody who has your, the same label kind of embody that completely differently um, or somebody who um, has certain experiences in common in common with you kind of frame that differently. Um, yeah. I've seen that. I've seen that so many times um, that, that rigidity and it really does just, it continue. It, it, it just, it perpetuates like all of the, all of the hate and all of the like, horrible stuff that people say about, about queer people and about, you know, just, I don't know there, it, it, it bothers me so much. It bothers me immensely that people just can't see that we are constantly changing and constantly evolving. And there, there are no rules there, there, there really aren't. I think that's, that's the biggest, like, 
That's the biggest mind fuck, honestly, as an adult, where like as a kid, I just thought like, oh, all the adults I know have it all figured out. Like they they know what life is. And as like a 35 year old, I'm like, I know nothing. And I, I feel like sometimes <laughs> I feel like the ground is being ripped out from under me day to day. And then other times it feels like it's rock solid. Um, sometimes I feel like I know exactly who I am and other days I don't at all. Um, and I think if, I think people are scared, I think they're scared of facing that within themselves. Um, and then that turns into hate and vitriol and, uh, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's a shame, um, because yeah. we all should love and support each other. Well, or even just, I mean, kind of some of that uncertainty like that to me, that's like, you know, it makes perfect sense to me why Chase would kind of feel like there are rules. We'd have to be told that there aren't, you know, um, like that felt so real to me, you know? I'm glad. I'm glad that that no. worked. I don't know. What do you think, Julian? I mean, I, I agree. I think um, that we all have some kind of systems that we need to break and and processes that we need to get rid of and biases that we need to get rid of um because of the environments that we're racing and that we continue like it's we continue the cycle over and over and over again and like becky was saying i think it is something that happens outside of the community i also think it's something that happens very much inside of the community mm -hmm. I think what i enjoyed so much about the book was um how I could relate to Chase on levels that we don't share same identities and certain as aspects, but that same feeling of this is who I know I am and who I want to be, but am I allowed to be this person? Um, and Chase feels it again, not only from family and from all these strangers that Chase is meeting at school, but also within the community that Chase is building at school and whatnot. Um, it's just this constant, am I enough? Am I too much? What, you know, how do I navigate this? And I, I love that because it, it has to be messy. It has to be that way because that is what real life is. It is messy. Um, and I feel in a lot of ways that breaking those rules while it's not like an overnight thing it's so important to continuously talk about no one should have a talk <clears throat> over how you live your life how you identify um and how you do any of this it shouldn't it shouldn't be like that um and no one has the right to come in and tell you that you don't meet xyz requirements in order to be the person that you already are yeah. It's, it, it's, it's, it's sad that, that, you know, we experience that and, and we feel that. Um, and that was something that I think, I think is just really important to, to, to what I'm, what I, I think my, my, my thesis statement as an author um, is to just sort of like try to explore the messiness <laughs> of things because things are messy. Life is not, life is not perfect. And that's sort of why, like, I like the, I, I, I like the whole idea of like, you know, these nice little fairy tales, right? Because everything just sort of um, seems to come together and there's a happily ever after. And it's, it's this whole <clears throat> story from in like 15 pages of like, you know, you, you start off with this character who wants something and then, you know, they go through the trials of trying to get it and maybe they don't get it right away, but then they do and it's a happily ever after. Or, you know, if you dive into some of the, you know, darker original fairy tales, you yeah. mm -hmm. get your toes cut off and all of that. <laughs> um, <laughs> or dissolve into the sea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like is more real life. Um, cause you know, every time I got my heart broken by a man, like, yeah, I'm going to dissolve into the sea <laughs> because I, you know, that's, that's just where I'm at. <laughs> yeah. yeah that, I, I, I liked, I like sort of contrasting that, like, you know, the, the perfection of the fairy tale with like the messiness that Chase is trying to like sort through, 
Um, that's kind of why I did that. Speaking um, of which, uh, before I ask my question, could you remind the audience about the giveaway and the questions so that they can? Yes, so people, absolutely. So people might have missed it. Yes. Thank you for that. I was actually, I was waiting for the 45 minute mark. So you are on it, Julian. Yeah. <laughs> 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 is, is listening right now. Um, ask us some questions. Um, we're going to pick a question. Uh, we're, well, we're, we'll, we will answer questions, but um, we're going to pick a winner from whoever answers questions and you will receive a copy of, and they live Jay's gay agenda. Here's to us. And right where I left you. Um, so, you know, that's a great little book haul. Just saying. So good. Um, <laughs> so Julian, what were you going to say? I was just saying, cause you were talking about diving and jumping into things. And I just, can we talk about the, the, the romance between Chase and Jack and that, that meet cute that happens in the beginning of the book where I was just like, Oh wow! Okay, this is this is nice. <laughs> I'm feeling yes. this. Let me get comfortable. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, so, so that so okay. So I have to say, um, I I run no risks. I don't think I run any risks of this person ever finding out. But Jack is based off of a real person, the first guy I ever fell in love with um, as a freshman in college. Um, and the when the first time I ever met was it was him was the first day of moving in and my um, a friend of mine that I went to high school with who ended up going to the same college as me like I met up with him and he was like oh I'm gonna meet up with all these people and I'm like how do you have friends already we've been here for four hours but okay sure um, and so like I went with him and. <laughs> We ended up at this at this um, this place in the woods um, where there were cliffs to jump into this river, like what sort of happens in the book. Spoiler alert! Sorry. Um, and I know I'm just I'm just give give away spoilers like Kit Kats now. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> and um, we there there wasn't he he was he was shirtless in real life and jumping off cliffs in real life, but I did not jump off cliffs in, in real life um, because I was too afraid of actually showing my body. Um, so I wanted to sort of have this moment of, of chase and meeting Jack and Jack being like, come in, come in the water. Like uh, let's swim together. You know, let's have fun. And it's not a, it's not a sexual thing. I think they do find each other attractive. Chase definitely thinks Jack is hot as hell. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I think, and I think Jack finds Chase attractive, maybe, but it's more of like, come on, like, what are you ashamed? Like, whatever, just get in the water, fine. Um, and I was really um, conscious of the fact that I didn't want it to be like the first time they meet and then they're instantly in love with each other and like right away, like, you know, they have their first kiss and all of that. Like it takes a it takes a lot of pages for them to get to their first kiss. Um, so like, I will smite anyone who says this is an insta love, but whatever. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I just, I wanted that to be true to something that I experienced of like meeting this person and instantly connecting with them on a friendship level and like this is somebody that i want to get to know like yeah i'm gonna go back to his his dorm room and hang out with him um and yeah i i'm i'm gonna like you know pretend to like just casually walk by his dorm in hopes that he pops out at the exact same time so it's like oh what are you doing here uh, that was a personal attack <laughs> right <laughs> Fancy meeting you here. Me too. That was that was me. That and that's still me. I'm still like, yeah, I'm gonna like walk by your whatever. I would still do that if I were single. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just I'm, I'm just brazen like that. Um, so, so yeah, I don't know. Did I did I did I talk about that enough? Did I? Answer <laughs> <laughs> uh, Julian, you read my mind on this. This is one of the things in my notes that I was like, we have to talk about when they meet. Because what I love about it is it's so sensory. Like, 
just to be surrounded by nature. And there's the coolness of the water, like paired with the heat and flush of being attracted to somebody. And there's the, just like the smell of being in nature and also leaning up against Jack as Chase is having this hard time swimming just because he's so flustered. And it was just like so many physical reactions happening that I think pair so well with that, like hubba hubba, I have a crush on somebody. And I loved it so much. And you're so good at pairing nature with moments of emotional connection, like at the Years and Years mm-hmm. concert without giving too much away, but just with it raining and feeling like you can catch lightning. It's like, it's the physical embodiment of how you feel inside when you're like, oh my God, I'm so into that. I feel like I could like grab this electricity from my body and show it to you. It's so good. Mm, thank you. I, I like all, it's funny, like those two scenes, like the, the scene where they meet and the scene at the concert were literal scenes that I plucked from previous versions of Chase's story and just like copied and pasted them and just, and changed and tweaked some things based on like whatever new stuff I was writing. Um, because those were scenes that like, I, I, I just, I gravitated towards and I had such a good emotional, um, I don't know, sensory experience writing um, that I don't know. Do you, do you guys like ever um, like write something and it, you love it so much, but you don't end up using it for like whatever, whatever you're working on now, but you can come back to it and like maybe use that or use that idea for something else later on. Like, does that ever happen to any of you? Literal files on my laptop where I just dump stuff that I can't use in a book but I save it so that I can, you know, do like kind of like the chase thing where I'm like revisiting, like, well, can I use it now? What can I use it now? Now? <laughs> When's the right time? <laughs> All right. <laughs> yes. But that, yeah, I have, I have so many of those files on my laptop. Oh, I love, it. love, I love, I love a good, I love a good writing process question. Um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm actually looking at some of the questions now that are like popping in. So oh, I'm going to like, God. I'm going to pop this, I'm going to pop this in. Um, because, uh, this question, what are each of your favorite parts of the writing process? I don't know. I need to think, I need I feel like I need to think about this for a hot second. Um, I love endings. Endings are right. You? I hate favorite. endings. <laughs> the like last Ooh. scene in a book, I freaking love. I think it's like when you can tie shit up. And you just feel so like, I am a sucker for happy endings. So in my books, I want there to be some version of happiness there. It might not be the one that you expect, but one that you like, oh, you realize everybody's happy with where they're at at this point in time. And being able to do that. And then I'm just like, ah, I'm so happy for all of you, my little children. (laughs) I know you're going to have a great life outside of this book. Go for it. I just love it. (laughs) Uh, how how but how do you does it like come naturally to you is it like i just like all of these threads are just magically woven together at the end in some like gorgeous jj tapestry like is that and <laughs> like how because i'm i str- i'm on the struggle bus with the endings all the time and i'm talking like the very 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 last scene is usually the same from first draft to publication for me, where it's like, here's how they're all going to be content. But then the couple of chapters before that, where like shit's hitting the fan Mm -hmm. and stuff is going wrong. And how am I going to tie that up? That's not as easy for me, but the whole sort of denouement where it's like, Oh, you're all happy again. Now that flows out of me pretty well. (laughs) Mm. I don't know. What about, what about you, Becky? I'm so curious. Yeah. You know, I feel like, um, in the past, I've been like, well, kissing scenes, which I do love writing. Um, I also love writing like drunk scenes. Um, <laughs> but I'm like, yes. I think my number one that I'm going to say is like a either a love declaration or like a crush confession when the person who's confessing doesn't know how the other person feels. I love when I like, and I love being in the head of the person confessing or the person on the receiving end. Like that is like, I think I, I will just like melt for that. Like every time. So. Mm, I love that. So. I love that. What about you, Julian? 
I like when I can make playlists and Pinterest boards. So everything before the writing starts. <laughs> <laughs> I totally, I've been doing ever since uh, a couple of days ago at the uh, book festival that Julian and I just came from in Texas. He mentioned a specific way he does his Pinterest boards. Oh. That has been my week. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh my god. You? Okay, now I'm curious. Can you share, share share for the class, please? So um good. what I do is I do like a main Pinterest board with all my inspirations and all that good stuff. But to kind of one, get myself really hyped about writing something, and two, to have something I can go to when I'm struggling writing is I'll make like a sub Pinterest board where it'll be like dedicated to a scene that I'm really looking forward to writing mm. or where I'll put in there like well, pictures of what's the environment going to look like and what what are, what are the characters wearing and you know what what kind of songs are playing or something something just to get me really hyped about writing that scene um like I said because then I'll just really want to actually start drafting and also because there's always a moment during writing where I just get flat out stuck and I can't do anything um and it's really just my imposter syndrome coming in saying you can't write this you're not at that level yet and so I need somewhere I can go to remind myself this is what I'm looking for like this is what I'm excited about and this is what I know only I can do kind of thing and so I make like a, a Pinterest board within a Pinterest board um to to kind of brush all that other stuff away. So that's one of my favorite part of the process. But if during the actual writing process, um, I really, really love that writing that will they or won't they moments. I live for that shit all yes. day long. Yeah. I love <laughs> writing that, you know, almost kiss or, you know, that clumsy, like, I, I think I'm about to confess. No, I'm not. No, no, no. I'm backing out. I'm backing out. I love that. <laughs> I was, that me. I was definitely me. So whenever I get to write stuff like that, it's, it's a lot of fun. I love that. I, for me, I think it's, um, I have two responses. The first response is I love writing sexy scenes. I, just I will never not love writing the sexy times and like the hot and heavy <laughs> sort of, you know, just magnetic connection moments. Um, I just I love that. And, um, but I also really love being experimental in in my writing. Um, like with and they lived, you know, getting to weave in Jack's poetry into the mm -hmm. narrative mm -hmm. and getting to weave um, the original fairy tale into the narrative, I thought was really great. Um, in my third book, I don't know how much I can say, but there is, we'll see, we'll see what my editor thinks about this. But as of now, there is a, I wrote a little mini film treatment script into the narrative because one of the one of the two um, main characters is uh, an aspiring filmmaker and he's okay. making a film um, to submit to a film festival. Um, so like I, I, I was I had a lot of fun like creating an actual story within a story formatted as a script. Um, so we'll see. Well, knock on wood. Hopefully my editor likes it. Um, cause that was just added into developmental edits. Uh, and I'm just blowing up things that aren't even anywhere near being out yet. Um, so yeah, so those are, those are the, the two things that I love the most. Um, let's see. Um, what's another question? Oh, I like this one. If you all had to choose a favorite wow. character from one of your books, who would you choose and why? Sophie's mm -hmm. choice. Okay. Mm -hmm. My uh, gosh. Mm -hmm. This is an affront. <laughs> well, I, would say I choose not to choose. And the reason why is because I'm a child of divorce and I can't. <laughs> <say it. laughs> oh my God. Yes. Okay. Wait, wait. Okay. How about this? Um, I'm going to reframe the question. If you all had to choose a favorite side character. Ooh. So oh, not no. a main, not a, not a main, but like your, you know, your kid's best friend, wow. you know, like we all, we all know like who the, who the favorite best friend is. Let's be honest. Yeah. I think that would be a little bit easier. Maybe. 
I don't know. I write ensemble cast. There's too many. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's true. You do. Okay, I'm going to be a brutal writer parent and pick a favorite. So okay. from, from my new book, Out of the Blue, that comes out on May 31st, um, I am obsessed with Kavya, who is Sean, who's the human character's best friend. And she's just this really funny, uh, horny, bisexual, amazing young woman who is like, she says everything that Sean wishes he could say and just gets it out there, but then also like has her own struggles and is like, she even says, I'm not just the funny sidekick in this whole moment where she has mm -hmm. her unveiling of her, her storylines and everything. And I really love that where she knows how to be jovial when the time is right, but she also knows how to assert herself. And that's the kind of like confidence I want going into the world. <laughs> I love that. Anybody else brave enough to pick a, a side character? <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Benny from And They Live. <gasps> yes, um, because he he truly deserves to be yes. protected at all costs. Uh, yes. He is he is just hysterical. He's so funny. I think he's funny, um, and I just love that Chase and Benny. Who Chase, uh, Benny is Chase's uh, roommate at college, and Benny and Chase have this like wonderful platonic gay friendship, and Benny is like. I'm going to teach you how to bottom, honey. Like, here you go. Here's a pamphlet. Like, here's all you know. Like, here, like, let's talk about safe sex. Let's talk about positions. Let's talk about all of these things that, like, you need to know because I'm sexually experienced and I'm your friend and I'm going to, like, help you through this time in your life. Um, and I think we all need a Benny, honestly. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say Benny. Um, I'm going to say Dylan from What If It's Us and Here's to Us, um, who, like, I love to write. I've added him to as many scenes as I can get away with, but I have to give a ton of credit to Adam Silvera, who, like, Dylan definitely, like, originated from that brain, um, and I, like, I... I feel like Dylan came, but, you know, it was kind of like, who is it that came out of Zeus's head fully formed? Was it like Athena or something? I don't know. That That's love Dylan. It. He's like, <laughs> yeah. So. Love, love Dylan. Love, love, love. So and Adam Zeus. Julian, it's all down to you now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I am cheating and just going with my most recent book because I love so many of my side characters, I swear. But I'm mm. going to go with... Um, there's a character in Right Where I Left You by the name of Alex. And she is the main character, Isaac, like his arch nemesis. Like she is, she shuts him down at any and every opportunity. She tells it like it, like it is. She calls him out on stuff. Um, and I loved writing her, but I also loved writing how they're forced into this hang into these hangout situations and you slowly start to see their relationship evolve and see not only um how they kind of like they pick on each other but also in the ways that they um connect but don't necessarily feel like they have to force it um it kind of comes like natural and i, I don't it's just so so much fun to write i actually had to delete her out of some stuff because like okay well this is great banter but also is this story <laughs> really, there? really not but Fun banter. <laughs> uh, she sounds like the perfect spinoff book character. I'm just oh, saying. Gosh. I'm just. I'm just like. Throw, <laughs> I'm just throwing that out there. I don't know. <laughs> but I. I. I love. I, I. I'm. I'm already loving Alex. That's fabulous. Um. Let's see. Um. I would really love to know what was the most beautiful part of the book to write, even if it's just a page number. Um. So. Well, for me, I, I really loved writing um, Jack's poetry. Um, anything, a anything that he wrote, I, you really get to like mine his character by reading his poetry. Um, and honestly, so I, I, I guess I'll, I'll also like you know talk about what what JJ was saying about endings. I really like the ending of And They Lived. I thought mm -hmm. I, I I had a really great time writing it and it just felt emotionally right. Um, 
and endings are extremely, extremely hard for me. And that was actually the hardest part of this book to write was the ending um, because I didn't quite know how I wanted it to end when I was like in the throes. And that sort of came, literally the ending came when I got to the ending part. I was like, oh, I need to end this shit. How do I do this? Um, <laughs> and so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go with how I feel. And it sort of ties into Jack's poetry in that way. Um, so yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to say, I'm going to say that. Um, ba, 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 ba. Let's see. Let's see. Um, what motivates all of you to continue writing, knowing that all your stories are important more than ever in the world we have today? I think it's kind of baked into the question. <laughs> yeah, that and like the, you know, the, the Pinterest boards that Julian mentioned. <laughs> like, mostly just that. <laughs> yes, yeah, Pinterest boards as motivation. I love it. <laughs> um, I, I, for me, I just kind of think like, I there's somebody out there who needs what we're working on, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I, um, I think about Simon Spear a lot. Um, sweet, delicate, beautiful, lovely Simon. And like how much Simon's story meant to me when I first read Simon Versus. Mm -hmm. And it was just like that, that, that's the reason, right? Like, cause I had been like, before Simon came out, like I, I had been, I had been querying for years and I remember being told nobody wants a coming out story. We don't want coming out stories, but we also don't want gay stories. So it's like, all right, well, what do you want? Okay, we want just like fully straight characters. Like that, that's it. Like that's all we want. And then Simon came out and it was like, this is what we need, Th yeah. this. And like reading Simon like gave me permission to continue writing because it was like, I just kept like just hitting up against brick wall after brick wall trying to like, get my stories out there. Um, and I thought I never would. Um, and then, the, so to me, it's like, I hope that one day someone can look at something that I wrote and, and be like, oh, like Chase or Carrie, like that's the reason why I continue to write or that's the reason why I felt validated or I felt seen for the first time in a long time or ever. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that. I hope that for I hope that for all of us, honestly. Every queer writer out there, every marginalized writer. Um I I, I, I every everyone needs our stories. Especially like, you know, as we all know, there's increasing attacks on trying to get books about queerness and race and any any group that's not a part of the the white straight <laughs> norm getting more and more attacks. So it's just my original mission when I started writing was to create the books that weren't around when I was a kid and was longing for. And now I'm just going to keep doing that. We have to, I think. Yeah. Um, can I give you guys some good news? The yeah. One yeah. Tiny, <laughs> this is like the tiny bright spot in all of this is, so my sister is um, a middle school teacher. She works in the county where I went to public school growing up where Simon went to school. And apparently, uh, I mean, this is like, it's like effed up. Uh, there was a vote on this, but apparently they voted on whether my, you know, I assume it was Simon could stay in the uh, Fulton County school library system. Um, and uh, they voted to keep it. <laughs> so good. So yes. Simon's district, um, it feels like such a tiny win, but I, I know that it, I, I know the book would have gone the other way when I was a, a teenager. So I'm trying to hold on to that. Yeah. That's yeah. so important. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. I think all those tiny wins, they add up. And I think that's important um, to remember 
is <clears throat> none of us had this growing up. I literally hated reading books as a kid. If it wasn't a comic book, I wasn't reading it, um, obviously, because our stories um, always came with the clause of the character is going to go through trauma and the character is going to deal with a lot of pain and most likely the character is going to die. Um, and so, of course, I didn't want to read those things because I didn't want to impose that on myself um, and how I thought. But, of course, that's what's going to happen when that's the only stories and the only narratives that you feed to people. Um I do, I do look at the the wins that we've had over the years. Obviously, the number of books grow and grow and grow. Where, where it used to be like, oh, the new queer book of, book of the month. Now it's like the, the new queer book of the day because there's so <laughs> many coming out. Um, and that's I think that's what keeps me writing is that there are so many different stories that have yet to be told from yeah. so many marginalized identities. And, if you, and it, then if you look at how intersectionality plays into there about how we haven't heard from people from uh, various marginalizations who might be, you know, whether it comes to race, religion, sexuality, um, all these different things, all these voices that we have yet to hear. That's what keeps me writing is because I know I haven't told all the stories I want to tell. Mm -hmm. um, and by telling my stories, hopefully I'm knocking down some doors and making room for other people to come in and be able to tell their stories. So I think that's what keeps me going. It, that teens, young readers, they need this stuff. Um, and we need to continue to fight for them and not them fight for us. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I, 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 I always say like until, until uh, marginalized writers have written like s certain tropes that like straight, you know, cis white writers have been writing forever, uh, then we haven't we we haven't uh, we haven't accomplished anything yet. We we have so many more stories left to tell. Um, that's why I get I, I I get really angry when you know you you see like a um, an author of color or a queer writer come out with a book and someone says like oh this has been done thirty times before and it's like has it though has yeah. it <laughs> ha actually though has it because I'm curious please. <laughs> Like I give me the footnotes because I don't, I don't, I've never seen this before, um, which is a problem in and of itself. Right. Um, so with that, what's your favorite trope to write? Um, is it different from your favorite when you're reading? <laughs> That's a great, like, especially that second half of the question is really like, huh? I, I don't know. I have to think about that. Yeah. I think my favorite trope to write, which I complained about earlier, is insta love. Um, <laughs> I, 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 whatever. whatever. I tweeted about this recently because it's like I get so angry um, when people complain about insta love because I'm like, listen, as 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 a gay person, like, um, I fall in love with every man I come into contact with. Like, in, like <laughs> it's like, I, and I'm married and I'm like, oh yeah, you're hot. I, I love, and then I'm going to walk away and like, forget about this person forever. But like, there's that instant, like, oh, wow. <laughs> um, and so like for me, and then, and like when I was single, it's like, oh, I've, I'm like, I'm in love with you and I'm planning my wedding in my head. Um, <laughs> I don't even know you. I don't know your first name or last name. Um, I don't even know if you're dateable. But I'm already marrying you and like buying a house, <laughs> um, and we haven't even exchanged words. Oh my god! Uh, so I love, I love, I love insta love. Um, yeah, and I like, I like reading it too. So I'm gonna say it's not different. I love that. I really like writing like crush to love, not necessarily yeah. friend to love, but when you have somebody that you're like. Oh my God, this person's really cute. Like Jay towards Albert in, in Jay's Gay Agenda. I love that whole moment of like, I know there's a spark there, but I'm a fumbling dork and I don't know how to make this where we actually end up together. Um, that's so much fun to write. Uh, but I really love to read enemies to lovers. When people can get oh. down that banter, yeah. I, it's just uh, mm -hmm. so much fun to read for me. I love that. 
Yeah, I mean, I, you know, as far as like what I love to read, I like don't necessarily have one favorite. Like I'm like all in for um, like, especially like rom-com coming of age that kind of like space um but also the fantasy and other you know but um for writing you know i think like one thing that i seem to come back to in a bunch of my books is like i i like to write a character who thinks they're um they're falling for one person but they're really falling falling for another person uh <laughs> Like, can anyone hear late? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Tell you. Uh, <laughs> Molly and Reed. Oh, my heart, my heart. Um, I love to, I'm like Becky though. I do love to read a lot of different tropes. Like I, I, I am such a sucker for a really well written trope. It could be even one that I don't like usually go for. If it's really well written, I'll I will, I'm all in. Uh, but I really love reading fake dating though. I don't know what it is about okay. fake dating, but I love reading. Okay. Uh, obviously, for mm -hmm. writing though, I seem to have this thing with friends to lovers. I don't know what it is. Um, no, I do. I do know what it is. I had to actually analyze this. Uh, for myself. I was like, why do you enjoy it so much? And I think it's because, uh, for me at least, as a queer person, all of my crushes and things like that usually started with someone who was a friend because um, being a queer person, when you find those safe spaces, you really like latch on to them. I think in friendships, um, when you're able to like come out to a friend and whatnot and be your most authentic self, um, it kind of like, sometimes it, it evolves from platonic to romantic or something like that. Um, and so from, I guess that's maybe why I write it because I like to write about places where I feel the most safe being my authentic self. Um, but I, I, I keep telling myself I'm going to write other tropes. One day, one day. <laughs> one day. We have, we have all the time and all the books in the world. <laughs> Because we're gonna, we're we're all gonna have careers into our like '90s hundreds. I'm gonna call it now. <laughs> um, yes. I love this question. So I know that JJ has done books for younger readers. Yay, Myrmicorns! Hey. <laughs> but does anyone else have any aspirations to write perhaps a middle grade book, sorely underrepresented in queer lit? I don't know. And anybody have middle grade aspirations? Oh, lots of heads. Yeah. I, theoretically, I'm I'm like I can't see beyond like my contracted. <laughs> you know, like I'm like that's too far into the future, but I'm open to it. I do want to also note that like just for everybody tuning in, y'all should know that um, JJ is my seven year old's favorite author. So. <gasps> No, that makes me so happy. I can't love tell you. Ah. <laughs> I love that. Love that. that little Mermacorn Island is where I would love to live. <laughs> I think all of us. I think that's like that's that's ideal, really. <laughs> yes. But I do have on my vision board writing a middle grade fantasy adventure series that I hope I can make work. That's so lovely. Yeah. That would be amazing. And you know it would be like deliciously queer. It would be. It would mm. be so gay. Mm. <laughs> I, 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 I love it. Um, I, I, I would love to write a middle grade one day. I do feel like that is a totally separate skill set that quite frankly scares me because there's, a, I, I don't know. It, it, it's like... You can't talk down to to middle grade readers because they are perceptive. They will they will they will see that, right? Um, so it's like straddling the line between like that YA sort of like no bullshit, but also like not getting you know as uh, as wild as one might in YA. Um, yeah, it's scary. It's scary for me. I would need to really feel comfortable 
to do that. Um, but I, I do want to, I'm, I hopefully am planning a, a, a dip into adult. I know that's not the question, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, you have aspirations to write middle grade. Um, it is sorely underrepresented in queer lit. When I was writing my story for the Black Boy Joy anthology, I had never written middle, anything middle grade in my entire life. So I was like, okay, well, I gotta do my research. I gotta read stuff. And I was specifically looking for books with queer black boys um, in middle grade. And I found one book. And so I told myself, um, I just can't let this, I can't let that continue. I can't um, think about all the opportunities missed to tell those um, young readers how very important they are, how valid they are, how how much I value them and um, how I want them to be their authentic self. So um, yeah, it's gonna happen. I just, I'm very much like you, Stephen, where I'm like, but how does one do this? So <laughs> I'm trying to do all my, my due diligence to read first uh, before yes. I jump into it. Totally, totally, uh, I think, Im Im important, especially for that age demo. Um, I'm just going to answer this question really, oh, this question really quickly. What is a song that captures the book? So I the theme song the theme song of this book I would say is years and years uh, shine. So if you haven't listened to Shine, go listen to it and read through the lyrics because I just listened to that song on repeat and the album that it came from like over and over and over again while writing this book specifically. Um, but I do uh, I'm just gonna have one more question and then we're gonna close things out. Um, oh wait, where did it go? Where did it go? Um, when you are all writing, do you have something specific that you hope readers take away from your stories or something you hope readers get out of your stories? I mean, this is a nice little sweet question to end things on. That's a great question. Who's an answer? <laughs> I mean, I will say like, yes and no. Like, I mean, I, I don't, um, because um, a lot of times, you know, I'm discovering parts of like what the story means to me, even as I'm writing it. And I kind of um, have realized by now, too, that like people are going to pull things um, from my work that um, I didn't even know I was putting in there um, in a good way, in a good way and sometimes a bad way. But um you know, so I think um, that's really exciting. Like I find that to be um, a really interesting thing about that moment when your book like enters the world and kind of starts interacting with the, uh, another brain, you know. Um, but um, sometimes, um, you know, I have like, you know, something about the book or what it's trying to say that I feel really strongly about that I'm like really happy if somebody um, hears it. But I don't think that like they're reading it wrong if they see it differently, I guess. So, yeah. yeah. For me, I usually go in with a theme I want to explore <laughs> and then, and then I hope like readers will take out their own how that relates to their own life. Like with Jay, the theme was like, what is it like to be literally the only gay person in your community? And then how does that, how does that uh, like rock your world when you're finally around other gay people? And so Jay goes about a very specific way of, of experiencing his gayness for the first time. But I'm hoping that readers like will find moments of connection with him and then also be able to sort of remember their first times of all the things that happen when you're finally around a queer community. And out of the blue, I'm exploring, can love for a person override your love for your home when you literally have to choose between one or the other? And I think that's also so often an experience in queer circles where we move around a lot and sometimes we find a space that is like, we love that physical space and we can't always stay there. And how do we decide between between the people or, or 
courses of our life that take us away from the physical space we love? Uh, or do we just decide that the space is what matters the most? And yeah, I just love to explore that a certain thing and then let readers kind of ruminate on it for themselves. What do you think, Julian? Uh, for every book, it's different. And I am so with JJ and Becky. I hope readers take, um, I hope like every reader takes something different from it. I really do. I, you know, I hope that they can, and then they can share that with other readers and kind of like explore those different things and discuss those things. There is just one thing that I do specifically hope that readers take from each one of my books is that um, joy does not have to be earned you deserve it. Um, and so that's, if I'm going to be specific about anything with all of my books, I hope that readers sincerely take away that you don't have to earn your happiness or your happily ever after or anything like that. You deserve it from the get-go. I love that. Yes. I, I love that. <laughs> oh, I almost don't even want to follow that. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is so good. <laughs> Um, oh gosh. Okay. So I guess I'll just talk about, and they lived. Um, cause I do, I, I agree. It is the, the objective is, is different for every book. I think maybe overall I would say hope, but that's sort of a broad thing. Um, but I think with, and they lived, I really wanted to, um, emphasize that you're worthy of love. Um, that you're worthy of loving yourself. You're worthy of love from other people. Um, allow people to love you. Mm -hmm. um, and that the point to quote, um, to quote the Drew Barrymore movie ever after the point <laughs> is that they lived right. And that's the whole point is it's not about happily ever after. It's not about, you know, um, any love story. It's not about that these, that two characters end up being together forever because what is forever? And we all know that like relationships are not perfect and they're definitely not perfect at all times. Um, but the point is that like, you get to figure that out as you go. Um, so in effect, there's hope. Um, so that's kind of what I'm hoping people take away from And They Lived. But um, anyway, <laughs> I just wanted to thank you all so much for um, just doing this with me and celebrating my book. And, and um, this ran so much longer than I thought it was going to. But I, I, I really love this entire conversation. And I think that um, people who tuned in really are going to get a lot out of this, I think. Um, so uh, Sam, I'm gonna ask Sam to pop back in here um, and see if we can pick a winner of the giveaway. Sam, what do you think? All right, could I get a drum roll, please? Uh, I don't know if anybody can hear this or if it's just rumbling thunder. <laughs> the winner of tonight's giveaway will be a user named Melissa Marie. Oh, hey, Melissa, Melissa Marie. Marie. Yay. Okay, so Melissa, if you can, um, if you're listening right now, I just popped this into the uh, comment section. If you can go to the contact form on my website and just email um, your address and we will get those books out to you once Julian's um, right Where I Left You cam uh, comes out, uh, which is next week or six days away. Um, so um, yeah, look for look for those then and a room one's own will will ship those out. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, a room of one's own so much for having us tonight. Um, if there's anything you want to plug from the bookstore, let us know anything that we can do any any events coming up. Um, oh, just uh, keep your eye out on our social media and on our website for future events. Thank you all to all you authors. Um, uh, this event, planning it and everything has meant a lot uh, to me and a lot of my coworkers at Room of One Zone. Uh, we appreciate it that you took the time to, uh, you know, speak to each other uh, for our benefit this evening so, so much. Um, and thank you to the audience 
It warms my heart every time people continue to show up for virtual events. We've been stuck doing them in this mode for a while, but the uh, silver lining is that we get authors from all around to uh, share a space and uh, to speak with each other over a great distance. Um, so I'm really grateful for that. I'm really grateful for this. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I really appreciate it. And uh, I hope you all have a great night. Awesome. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, Jason June, so much. I love you all. Mwah. Thank so, you, so Steven. Much. Congratulations. Yes, congratulations. congratulations. Everyone go go buy all of their books and pre-order pre right where I left you. There's like a couple days left to pre-order and pre-order out of the blue. And if you haven't gotten here's to us yet, I don't even know who you are. Doesn't even <laughs> <laughs> just get out of here. Um, well, I, love, I love you all so much. Thank you. And love thank you all too. for tuning in. Bye. Have a good night. Bye.